There's a fog upon LA And my friends have lost their way They'll be over soon, they said Now they've lost themselves instead parents and called score de tura, which means the bad score or the discordant music because no one really understands tablature so tablature is a secret language that the minions of academia the uh, well-respected authorities and officials who teach mathematics and music know nothing at all about tablature as a formal mathematical language. And I'm here to talk about the principle of minimal realization, which is the idea that given any piece of music, you can always find the best guitar arrangement under a large number of experiments. And the good news is uh, there's an efficient way to do that so that uh, you might think it's just impossible to figure out how music goes in a record, but actually uh, the mathematics of it say that the behavior of the guitar allows you to pull back the guitar tuning. So this leads to a method of leading guitar where the tuning comes first, then you find out the best key inside of the tuning, and once you know the best key and the best tuning, then you choose the guitar intonation that matches the record. And that avoids the mistake you have when you think, well, if I hear the note, I can find the note on the guitar. But until you know what the tuning and the intonation are, that's a recipe for ending up with music where you have the right pitch, but the wrong guitar position. So you have to start first by guessing the tuning and then finding the key and then repeating that until you find the best possible tuning and key. And it turns out that's not as difficult as you might think. And so this goes out to uh, Walter Everts, the Beatle expert, because about 10 years ago I told him that Lucy in the Sky was in open D, and he told me, well, first of all, how would you possibly know that? And second of all, what difference would it make? Um, so, here's, here's what we have. Quite slow. 
most common Beatles chord progression, and it's based on a blues turnaround. So what you have there is you have A, A7, D, with the 9 on top, and then the D minor, which goes down to the D flat augmented chord. So that's, that tells you you're an A, and then these easy to play chords going down. And then it looks like the key changes. Sort of the six parts of the Beatles songs. One of them is the is this chord space spacing progression, where the chords stay the same and they just move up and down the neck like this. And then you have the the voice leading progression, where the chords stay in one position. goes from when they were just uh, just beginning and recording things at home on their tape recorder to the you know the uh, Sgt. Peppers and all the uh, more advanced songs and so you get a really good idea of how they developed as musicians and you can kind of see connections between songs for example there's this um, this one early song they had was um, lend me your comb starts out with this kind of a country pick. guitar and uh, then he says uh, I cannot do it and then he starts playing again and somehow he's in the same key but the way he started that makes me think he's got the melody here like the, the another part of the Beatles song is the melodic hook and a lot of times you find it right there on the guitar um, and so it makes me think he's thinking of the melody Then he uh, starts playing and he's playing like this. No one I think is in my tree. No, it must be high or low. That is, you can't, you know, tune it, but it's all okay. That is, I think it's not too bad. Take 
take you down Cause I'm going to Strawberry Fields Nothing is real And then the get home now Strawberry Fields Forever And then this is a little more like the record Standing on the scene, it's getting hard to be someone that all works out. It doesn't matter much to me. No one I think is in my tree. same tuning and um, it's in the it's not in the key of the recording but um, I think it's probably a part of the origin of the song it goes like this I'm going to strawberry fields. Nothing is real. Nothing to get out of Strawberry fields
Though this tuning is, is open D, or some of these songs are in open E, and um, it's the intonation of the tuning that really throws you off because uh, you, you think that like the tuning can go up or down in pitch as a whole, the guitar as a whole can go up or down, and it doesn't affect what you play because the tuning is the same. So you think that it doesn't matter if you change from open D to open E, but actually it does matter because what happens is you have to transpose the key in order to match the record or to play along with your band is not going to uh, change the key of the song just because you change the tuning. So when you go from open D to open E, you have to transpose the key down and so you get this weird effect where open E is clearly a brighter kind of uh, tonality but somehow the key is the same but you hear that it's lower on the guitar it has a little more crunch. Uh, so um, when the Beatles play songs in open C which is open D just move down to C it really throws you for a loop. It just sounds like it's almost otherworldly. songs that can kind of cross over and you get the feeling that their uh, Beatles kind of hone their songs by going back and forth between tunings. You go to a different turning and you pick up a little trick and then you take it back to the first tuning again and use it there. And so um, this is one of the songs where it works out really nice in open D minor because it's a natural for the key in F. Um, and open D minor has its kind of an orthodoxy, it's kind of like straight and it, the chords make a lot of sense, whereas open D is a little bit trickier, but um, this one I figured out, you know, at first it seems like, oh, for sure it's in, in open D minor, but then I learned this version in open D and it's actually a little bit easier. <laughs>
So this song is like a wellspring of, of uh, Beatles guitar tonality, and it, um, it just seems like it has every little trick uh, in the, that they use in all the other songs. Uh, so let's go over them. This is, this is F, and this, this walking down. That would be like A minor, A flat, G minor. And this is what the um, the tricky part about open D is. You have this this great major chord, but the minor chord is a challenge. And so uh, what happens for the minor chord is you you it's you have the bar, and then the third drops back. So it kind of creates this chord like with an I here from the bar and so you have like a number of different ways that you play the, that minor chord because um, you can't grasp all six strings in the chord and so you have to play it like in a sort of a decomposed chord where you're, you're only playing part of the chord and there are several tricks for doing that. One is uh, you can have these different variations and one variation comes off of this chord that looks like an E chord in standard tuning, but that would be E minor. And so you, you have like the diatonic chords go. And so this chord, is, it's like an artsy minor chord because you just let it harmonize with whatever the top strings are. And so you get kind of jazzy combinations and it, sometimes that'll work but in a lot of songs you want that crisp triad that you get like with uh, open D minor and so one way to get around that is what I call like a fake minor chord where this is this is a major but you can use it for A minor too if you just hit these three strings or at any rate, don't don't hit this one uh, note on the third string that will identify the chord as a major. So a lot of times you can you can you can fake. So this is F, and I'm using that as an A minor. And then there's this this jazzy chord, which is like a flat five substitute. goes up to the fourth chord and that progression I showed you that's based on the blues turnaround that goes the one, one seven, four, four minor chord. That's uh, the four, mi four chord to the minor and then dropping back to the tonic. That's the classic Beatles progression. You see it in so many of their songs. You know like if a chord is played first, it's a major, and then it's a minor, it's going back to that tonic for the next chord. And if the four minor chord has like a nine or a six, it's like it signals that it's going to be the last time. And then it also has the part where it goes up to G minor. And then you get one of these voice leading uh, progressions, which I look at as a deformity of you have like a, either start with a major or minor chord, and then you deform it by a set of notes that march either down or up. And they usually go, you know, continue in the same direction, but sometimes they're, sometimes they move in opposite directions, but this one goes, so you have G minor, that's G flat augmented. So in, in the music books they'll show this is like G minor, and this will be G minor major seventh. G minor G 
minor major seventh. But a better name is to name it after the augmented chord, because that's what this is. And so it goes from G minor, down one step, and augmented. So that's G flat augmented. And that's, that's a really important distinction, because the augmented chord is, is really guitaristic. It moves in, in four, every four frets, the augmented chord repeats. And um, so these augmented and diminished chords come in these voice leading progressions, um, and uh, they're, they're highly specific to the tuning. And open D is by far the, the greatest number of these voice leading progressions. And of course, the, the signature one is this blues turnaround. So that's one, D, D7, one, seven, G, G minor. Okay, and the, vo the chord spacing progression would be so for example we have this one class of all turnarounds in any tuning possible and you can compare it to like uh, open D minor open G and open G minor because they all have this the same turnaround but this this one is is clearly the best because it has a best in class seven sharp nine chord. Some people call it the Jimi Hendrix chord, but it's actually tax pad came first. Let me tell you how it will be. Taxman. One for you, nineteen for me. Have you heard? Have you heard? Say the word and be like me. Have you heard? The word is love. 
sounds like you're copying the record, but actually it's playing it against the open D. Now, if you play this in standard, you play it like, you play this sort of this E7, and you get the sharp 9 there, and you've got the open string, and uh, the open bass string, and you've got a, a pentatonic box here, and so that what you it sounds okay, but the problem is this chord takes up all of your fingers, and so you, this one only takes one or two fingers, and you've got a nice uh, pentatonic box there, and you get this chord or this chord. There's no way you can even play this chord in standard tuning, or you, you can actually play it, but it's pretty hard because you're holding down five strings with four fingers, and so it's, it's not practical and it doesn't have the utility of this chord. Now, Hendrix looks at this chord, and, and so he's got this one here, and then if you move it up here, you have this chord. C-sharp and F-sharp because I mean, those, you could play them in standard tune but they aren't particularly uh, strong chords whereas in this tuning now this would actually be like if this was open E uh, so I'm going to talk about it as if it's open E so this would be C-sharp the uh, E7 sharp 9. If we slide that down three steps, get to the where this is on the open position, so that's the C sharp. And so then a little bit of rearrangement, you get this. This is a really cool 7 sharp 9 chord in the open position.
like the earliest Beatles songs, you pick up some interesting things like this one. It's like uh, e, e flat B7, e e flat B7, E A flat, and then this one. That's C sharp seven. difficult open D chords and it it comes about in um, in some voice leading progressions that makes it kind of cool but you could sort of it's like you have this C G B flat 7 And then one of the things that's really noticeable about open D is it doesn't have an open position B flat chord. So it has this B flat 7. And if you move that up with a bar, so that's B, B7, C7. And um, that comes around in I Call Your Name. they're pretty specifically keyed to an open note. So in this one, that you can only probably play that in a D tuning, uh, and if you tr play it in another tuning, it will be much more difficult. Um, and uh, so going back to this chord Is broken when 
more. This is G sharp minor. That's F augmented. That's A. And then that funny C7 chord. And that song you can tell it also has a, a, a lead part in open G uh, that's harmonizing with that uh, that uh this iconic chord. It's been a
I was younger, so much younger than today. Never needed anybody's help in any way. But now these days are gone, I'm not so self assured. Now I find I've changed my mind. Let me your ears and I'll sing you a tune. 
tune And then I'll try not to sing out of key Oh, I get by with a little help from my friends Oh, I get by with a little help from my friends I'm gonna try with a little tried to sell to the stones. I wanna be your lover, baby. I wanna be your man. I, I wanna be your lover, baby. I wanna be your man. I wanna be your man. I wanna be your man. So that's a, uh, another part of the Beatles song is the, the octave uh, lead. And so in open D you get the best set of octaves that there are uh, because you've got the octaves on these strings and another set of octaves on these strings. Probably don't use this as much, but um, so you've got something like this. Um,
power of like just playing the whole thing with just a bar chord practically. And it's making really good use of the of the space here uh, that's created by the tuning. of pitch which means you play this string and you hear the pitch um, so that's the transducer function of the guitar but most people don't think about the recognizer function of the guitar and we think of it this way suppose that um, we got this data from outer space and we didn't know what it meant because it didn't have the song title or the tuning. It was just a series of numbers. And uh, so we get the idea, well, there's six lines of numbers, so maybe it's tablature for guitar. And then what we can do is we can play the tablature in every guitar tuning until we get to the one that sounds like this. Say you do when you don't Say you will, baby, when you won't Uh-uh, baby, then step it around Uh-uh, baby, all over the town uh -uh, uh -uh. was written in this tuning because we recognize the music so we say the guitar recognizes the tablature and accepts the instructions as proof that the tablature was written in this tuning and by that I mean it's a mathematical proof that the tablature and the tuning fit together like a lock and a key so under those circumstances uh, you, you will always be able to find the tuning and if you have like say a guitar with one bad string you could still recognize the music but you notice like every time the note falls on that bad string the pitch is off by the same number of steps and so that would lead you to correct the tuning of that string so you can see how you could find the uh, tuning for the guitar uh, 
without having to go through every one in serial order. There's a shortcut to finding the proper guitar tuning for an unknown tablature. Now, the problem of finding the tablature for music in a record is, is, is more difficult but it's the same principle is that you're you're going to search through different tunings and keys and you're going to come across one that is the one that is the best that you will recognize and i don't think there's any question that that's how that song is played uh, by the beatles an interesting study is is a uh, day tripper because you could take that intro uh lead and uh, play it in different tunings and I'm I'm well aware that there's a video of George Harrison playing uh, Day Tripper in standard tuning but I still think after going through all the tunings that open D is the best and it goes <laughs> because all tunings have the same first string relation. In other words, this is the zero note, zero pitch, zero fret. This is the first pitch and the first fret, second pitch, second fret. So they just run together and they're always the same for every tuning because they always start at zero on this string. So this part doesn't tell you the tuning, but it does tell you what what note this is, and you can kind of tell it's the open string note. And so, in D tuning, you have this funny uh, problem with the, this G note can only be played in one position, and in standard tuning you want to play it here on the third fret, but in this tuning, and almost every other tuning, G belongs at the fifth fret, because that's like its natural home. And so you look at these notes that are uh, played as they can either be in front of the bar or behind the bar. So. That's, that's the hard way to do it. And then behind the bar you have this problem where you have to kind of jump over. seems unnatural when you're when you first uh, learn this tuning it, this seems like a weird lick because of that jump because you have to you hit the G here and then you have to jump over here but that's how it's done and that's sort of like part of the open D dialect that you get used to and it just occurs in a, so many. sort of classic thing where you have the melodic hook and then you have the 
chord spacing progressions. And that's one reason why I like this in uh, opposed to, say, drop D. Because you get the whole six string chords. That's classic beat. And the interesting thing is, there's a third part in the, in the uh, sort of like the bridge where there's a third lick. And you can't play it. It's sort of awkward to play in this tuning. But there's no, there doesn't seem to be any tuning where you can play all three of those licks in, on one guitar. Because in standard, you could play the, the, uh, the lick in E. You could play it uh, on the A string, but then there's the in the bridge the lick starts on B, and, and you just can't do that in standard tuning, uh, and you can't do it in this tuning. So I think it's probably got like a open A tuning for that, and it just really like the open D tuning for some of its uh, tonal expressions, like this one. Progression um, from a song they never recorded. It's you can find it in the um, ATV sheet music scores. It's called "I'm in Love," and they just want to show the uh, progression. So it's A minor, then the A flat augmented, C. D, F, F minor, C. So it's kind of a, um, a diatonic bending, like it's kind of hard to understand the progression of these chords as a diatonic progression, but it's kind of has these uh, the augmented chords stuck in there as part of the voice leading. C, D, F, F minor, C. When I'm walking beside people tell me I'm lucky. Yes, I know I'm a lucky guy. shows what a good key A is in open D because so that's the one four five one flat seven four and then that's a fake minor chord wonderful open position chords which you can't duplicate in standard so you have this is G same as this or maybe like that this looks like an E7 in standard and then you have this B minor chord nice open and then that you like about these chords is they have this like a lot of sustain because there's so many open strings and they just keep going on uh, and that's kind of opposed to like the bar chords where you can mute with the left hand you get a very crisp staccato sound whereas in the open position chords you have this like this sort of 
uh, carrying on of the, the voices. And so you have this A7 is a unique A7 chord that you can't play in the piano. This is got, it's a tonic fifth seven tonic fifth and it just has a really nice um, nice delicate sound. probably is one of the first songs is Police Dog Blues by Blind Blake and um, it's just says open D so clearly that no one would ever doubt that open D is the the tuning of Police Dog Blues and it's kind of like Lucy in the Sky where you could play it in open D minor it, I mean, it wouldn't be a problem, but it would just be more difficult than open D. And, and so I, I don't think there's any doubt that the, uh, the Beatles either like new police dog blues or they, from their work as skiffle bands and so forth, they knew something like that, that they understood the, um, the open D tonality. to play that lick and 
You may think that I'm just fitting all of these songs into Open D because you can play any song in any tuning. But the fact is that if you play a song in every tuning, you can list the tunings in order of which one is best and which one is worse. And they, that's a property that the tablature has. You can you you can you can't calculate the tablature for the Beatles song, but you can parse it. And what parsing parsing means is if you have one way of playing the Beatles song, you always think that's right. But if you have two ways of playing it, then you realize one way is better than the other. And so what happens is when you only know standard tuning, you think every Beatles song is in standard tuning. But some of them are really hard to play, and some of them don't make any sense. So then when you know drop D and standard, you look at it and say, well, you know, probably half of these songs are in standard tuning, and half of them are in drop D. And which is which is, is pretty clear. You can, you can tell, because you have these ones with the DAD configuration in open D, and they'll look like they're in drop D. But when, when you sort them that way between two tunings, you get kind of a pretty clear separation. And so, as you increase the number of tunings that you look at the Beatles songs with, you get better and better at classifying the songs and sorting them out between which tuning is correct for which one. And as you go through this process, you come on tunings and you say, wow, that tuning is just, it's got to be the best tuning. Uh, and the, that's something that's, it's a, it's a mathematical process. Uh, and the way it works is, it doesn't matter what the first tablature sentence you write. You take a Beatles song and you write it any tuning, any kind of one, you just import it into tablature. And that's called your working sentence. And the cool thing is, it doesn't matter what your first working sentence is, you're still going to end up with the best tab if you go through this process of first you find the tuning, then you find the key, then you find the intonation. And you keep doing that over and over again until you find the best possible one. And it gets to the point where you cannot find a better example, a better tablature. So you look at the music you hear in the record or in the score as being the problem. And the tablature is the solution to the problem. And so what happens is you think it's going to be really hard to figure it out, but actually a relatively small number of steps is required to get from your first working tablature to the best tablature. Now the problem with the process is you only know that you have the best tablature you've found so far. So you have a list of tabs. You can always tell which one is the best but you don't know that you have the absolute best. There's always possible a uh, better tab out there somewhere that you haven't found yet. But what the process tells us is you can't keep finding better and better tabs indefinitely. You converge. The, the uh, tablature gets better and better and better and then it gets to a point and there is no better tuning possible. And so um, what has happened in the publishing industry is they figure first of all people don't want to learn guitar and other tunings which is, is certainly true and also it's too much trouble to figure out how the part, guitar part goes in the record because it takes more work. now. Anyone can transcribe a Beatles song in a musical score and they don't need to know anything about guitar at all. And that transcription is universally good for playing on any instrument, including guitar, but it doesn't tell you how the guitar part goes. So you have like uh, Walter Everett's book, 
Beatles as uh, musicians, two volume set, and discusses all of the diatonic uh, chord progressions and the modes that the Beatles use in great detail, but it's all sub-analytic to the Beatles guitar, because if you know they're playing a C chord, the question is, which C chord is it? Is it this C chord? And is it so much hard, hard to tell whether it's this one or this one? The question is whether it's this one or the C chord in open G, which you play down here. And you can pretty much tell open G from open D, because even if you play the same chords, they are in different parts of the guitar, and so usually you can't get confused. But um, sometimes you, you can think you have the best arrangement and you don't. So I don't know if these are the best possible arrangements, but I know they're the best ones that I can find. And sometimes I still find better ones. one that's like uh, in say G and then another one that's in F and so for this song because there's another way of playing it I want to show to you and the implication is that the one I played this one is lower so that would be like a, maybe an open E and this one would be the same music in open D
those early songs that it's not a hit song, but it shows how they're composing in this context of open D, that it's these diatonic chords. <laughs> This is the five chord, and the augmented sounds more seventh than the seventh chord. So um, now, for this kind of for that kind of uh, rock and roll because this is the lowest key where I have the bar chord here. I don't want to go down to this one because it sounds too country. I want to have a matched set of, of shuffles. And incidentally, the uh, open D is the best in class shuffle because in the open position, takes one finger and the bar similar ones in open D minor but a little bit more difficult to play so so those make like a really powerful uh, uh, shuffle and so you have like uh,
really nice voice leading. Three chords that seem like they're they don't resolve. But somehow I want to show you this ostinato bass for that. specific bass. so nicely in that tuning. I think it's, it's a very convincing uh, example, even without the other chords. This one has always uh, fascinated me. I'm not sure if I have it right, but... subsets of the octave. So this is seven. That's, that's part of an octave, seven frets. Five. These are all intervals on the octave. And they create a special kind of arithmetic that you learn when you learn guitar. Now we say guitarists learn by ear, but actually that's wrong because the pitch is sub-analytic. The pitch doesn't tell you how the music is played on guitar. So even if you can hear all the notes clearly in the record, which is usually not always true, you cannot tell from the pitch 
where the note is played on the, on the guitar. You have to tell that from the tuning. And so you have this start state of the machine, which is 7, 5, 4, 3, 5. And from that state, every other state on the guitar is known. So in other words, you learn guitar from the tuning and nothing else. Okay, it's the only the intervals on the tuning. And the great thing about it is you can learn it intuitively. You don't need the mathematics because you could you just you know you just automatically know that any note on this string is going to be found five frets higher on this string, and that kind of math just comes naturally. You don't have to think about it. But if you think about it closely, you realize that there are, there are peculiar things about the math, and without them you can't understand the guitar. So the point of the math of guitar is that you approach the guitar systematically and you, you're guided by the knowledge that it's not as difficult as you think. These Beatles songs, they're pretty easy to figure out. If you know the tuning and the key, you're always going to be able to figure out how they go. And if you know the tuning but not the key, you're going to be able to find the key because there are, there are good keys and there are bad keys. And, and so you can tell what key is most probable.
there, there are some licks that you can play both in open D and open G. And so the, uh, like you have this turnaround. and then you have one just like it in open G but it's shifted to one set of higher strings so you just move everything over one set of strings and then you, you're in the open G lick and it's a useful memory aid but it, it often doesn't work out very well for changing because you, you kind of like to keep the D strings uh, you know there's something about these D octaves that is really special because almost every tuning except standard and drop D or it has this uh, these three octaves and it's it's clear that it's a powerful uh, harmonic uh, cre creation. So um, you have this one, this lick. because of the reliance on pitch because the notion of pitch is always derived as a limit value at the threshold of auditory perception and it makes you think that the pitch is the same for every guitar and so the undisputed value of pitch in learning guitar is always limited by that auditory perception that all guitar tunings must sound the same if they play the same notes. And in fact, if that were true, then every tablature version would be as good as every other, and every other tuning and key would be as good as this one. But in fact, this is probably the best tuning uh, it could kind of, you know, be debated whether open D minor is better, but most of the other tunings are they're not quite as harmonically perfect as this this chord, and so uh, it's you could make a good case that that uh, open D and that the family, which includes open E and open C, that are tuned the same way, just up and down in pitch. Uh, are are probably the, the the best single tuning and one thing that's uh, really nice about open D is the pentatonic scale so basically each guitar tuning has just one pentatonic scale that moves up and down the neck according to the key but it's basically the same pattern that runs up and down the neck and so you think that if you play the pentatonic scale in two different tunings, they would sound the same. But in fact, that's not true because the shape of the pentatonic tuning and the relations between the notes are different, and so they sound different. So for example, in open D, the, the minor chord is, is the one that's really hard to fig, finger because you, you can't, you have these versions like 
they sort of have a problem. Like this is your A minor chord. And it's a good A minor. It's got that bass string here. You kind of pick up the E and the bass string. But it does take four four fingers to play. And so this one is going to take three or four. And then there's one up here. It's kind of hard. It, it's useful for D, D minor. But when you play the pentatonic scale, Oh, you, you really like the minor chord because you can almost go straight up. And you have this um, sort of beetle way of looking at the uh, uh, chords as being basically triads. You have the, the triads, the major, minor, augmented, and diminished triads. And then the other chords, the six, seven, and nine, you look at as just notes that are added to the bar. So you have like a sustained note here, six, seven, nine, sharp nine, and you have this uh, kind of a nice Hendrix diatonic scale. for each note. So that's a really uh, pretty and easy to play diatonic scale. I've been told when I boy kiss a girl Take a trip around the world every day Now the, the ostinato bass in this Much better because that ostinato bass has the um, has the open strings where you want them, and you got that kind of thing where you don't have to go down to the open open chord, which would sound more country. So you have more control that way, and so what happens is. Say you think that, say you want to copy uh, something Hendrix is playing and he usually has his guitar intonated at E flat. And so you think, well, he's just playing in the key of E and he's tuned his guitar down to E flat. And the mistake you're making there is that you're already assuming that he's in standard tuning in the key of E because it could just as well have be that he's playing in the key of D and he's tuned up a little bit or the recording is speeded up a little bit. So what you're, you've actually done in that is you put the tuning first, which is standard, and then the key is the best key is in E, and then you adjust the intonation to match the record. And that's exactly the procedure you want to follow, but what you need to do is you need to go back and then try a second tuning. Because if standard is the only tuning you know, you, you think that every Beatles song is in standard tuning. 